I've conf have you confirmed, Vic? Because I've not heard anything. Yeah, sorry, Lisa. Yeah, we're now live. Lovely, thank you. So welcome to this virtual licensing and appeals committee meeting that is being conducted with members and officers at various locations, communicating via audio, video and online. There is also the opportunity for the public and press to listen and view proceedings. Before the meeting starts, I would like to invite the committee member and scrutiny manager to explain how proceedings will work and to confirm that members and officers are in attendance, please, Hilary. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, first of all, I'll call, uh, do a roll call. Um, so if you can answer to confirm that you can hear and be heard. Sorry, I'm going to cough. <coughs> Excuse me. Councillor Albert. Present. Councillor Allen. Present. Councillor Dennis Harburg. Here. Councillor McNally. Present. Councillor Morris. Yes, here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor North. Here. Councillor Rice. Councillor Rice. Some You're muted, Mike. You're still muted, Councillor. I'll come back to you in a second. Uh, Councillor Rogera Chaka. Present. Councillor Thake. Present. Councillor Tyson. Yes. And officers, we have uh, Jeanette Thompson. Good evening. Steve Cobb. Present. 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 Oh dear, Molly Shields. <laughs> Here. Uh, we have Vic Godfrey supporting us on IT and I'm Hilary Deneen. Let's just double check that we have Councillor Rice. Present. Thank you very much indeed. My space bar's not working. Uh, there's always one thing or another, isn't there? Um, so when the meeting is being live streamed on Council's YouTube channel and recorded up via Zoom, if live stream fails, the meeting will adjourn. If the live stream cannot be restored within a reasonable period, then the remaining business will be considered at a later date. Please stay in view of the camera at all times. If for any reason the meeting is not corporate, an officer will notify attendees. The meeting will adjourn immediately. Once the meeting is corporate, the meeting will resume. If connection cannot be restored within a reasonable period, then the remaining business will be considered at a later date. Only members present for the entire debate and consideration of an item are entitled to vote. If a remote member loses connection, the chair may adjourn the meeting for a short period to enable connection to be re-established. If the chair does not adjourn the meeting, the member will be deemed to have left the meeting at the point of failure and be deemed to have returned at the point of re-establishment. Please ensure that your mobile phone and other noise emitting devices are muted. Please activate the mute button on your tablet or computer when you are not speaking and be mindful that others can see you. If a member wishes to speak, they should raise, use the raise hand button and please remember to unmute your microphone before speaking. When requested to vote, voting will be via the green tick for yes, red cross for no and blue raise hand abstain functions. To enable the votes to be counted, please do not clear the votes until you are requested to do so. Are there any questions? No, in that case, I will now hand over to the Chair, Councillor Lisa Nash. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Hilary. Um, have we got any apologies for absent? Oh, from David Barnard. Just got apologies from David. Are there any other apologies? No? Okay, lovely. Um, notification of other business, none is advised. Um, Matter three, Chair's announcements. In accordance with Council policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on mod.gov and the film recording via the NHDC YouTube um, channel. Members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item. The detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under Chair's announcements on the agenda. Um, there is no public participation tonight. So we move on to item six, um, five, sorry, I can count. Um, adoption of a taxi and private hire licensing policy. So over to you, please, Steve Cobb to present.
been on mute. As the lead officer for the taxi policy was Molly Shields, Molly's going to introduce this item for you. Okay, can everybody hear me? <laughs> Good. Okay, so you're going to have to bear with me, I'm afraid. My um, sort of introduction is quite lengthy. Um, I'm going to try my best to sort of look at the screen, but I'm reading off another screen as well, so please bear with me. Okay. So good evening, Chairman. For those on the committee that have considered previous versions of the policy, you will be used to it being called the Hackney Carriage and Private Hire Licensing Policy. Government are starting to amend the terminology it uses to taxi and private, private hire, and this is considered easier for the public to understand. Therefore, the title has been amended to taxi and private hire licensing policy. As members, you will be aware that the policy is kept under regular review to ensure it remains fit for purpose and reflects changing circumstances whilst promoting the stated licensing objectives. Whilst the policy allows for minor amendments to be made without public consultation, which has happened on a few previous occasions, the proposal this time had the, the potential to be significant financial or procedural effect on the licensed trade. Therefore, a full consultation was undertaken. Prior to the consultation, discussions were held with the Taxi and Private Hire Forum who were generally supportive of the proposals. It was felt, however, that the number of options should be offered where possible to support popular, to offer popular support. Disappointingly, only 18 responses were received from the licensed trade, despite over 300 consultation emails being sent out. But on a positive note, 17 responses were received from members of the public, including some very thoughtful and well-reasoned responses. Officers have assumed that in the absence of responses that the licensed trade have no strong views other than those 18 responses received. Appendix B summarizes the main points from all consultation responses with officer comments. The full response are available in Appendix C. The proposed policy at Appendix D reflects the responses received during the consultation period and is based on officers' professional opinions. Members should be aware that the proposed policy was discussed with the Trade Forum pre-lockdown and so did not consider the impact of the ongoing national restrictions of the pandemic. Additionally, Following years of hints that national standards were to be introduced, the government unexpectedly published its new national standards mid-consultation. These standards are mandatory unless the local authority can demonstrate compliance with the intention in an alternative manner. Many of the proposals that the trade find unacceptable are included in the national standards, therefore we have little discretion. The proposed policy has been amended to acknowledge the advancements in technology, the Council's declaration of climate emergency, to streamline the Council's approach to enforcement options, and to ensure that the report remains fit for pur purpose and supports the Council's priorities and strategies. These measures include no idling, we receive regular complaints about taxis idling, but this is a traffic offence enforceable by the police. By adding it to it into a policy requirement, officers can enforce through the penalty point system. Restricted taxi ranks. Whilst this is currently an aspirational, it is important that it is in the policy, so when the appropriate, appropriate infrastructure is available, it can be implemented to encourage the use of more environmentally friendly vehicles by offering those vehicles exclusive use of prime location ranks. Environmentally friendly fleet. Rather than wait for the government's national regulations re regarding the manufacture of petrol and diesel vehicles, it was felt important that the council takes a lead locally. 
consideration should be given to the cost of the transition to existing vehicle owners, and the proposed dates reflect that balance. It is also considered important that the policy has sufficient flexibility to encompass further technical, technological advances. Therefore, the focus has been placed on the ultra low emission vehicles rather than just electric vehicles. Technology is ever evolving and it is important that the council recognizes this and supports the taxi trade where possible. The proposed policy offers improved improvements for the taxi trade and customers. A cashless culture is very much upon us, especially in light of the COVID pandemic, and the proposed policy supports drivers in, in installing contactless card payment technology, digital booking and GPRS vehicle tracking. In addition to benefiting customers, this also supports drivers by enhancing their business and reducing risk by limiting the amount of cash they need to carry. Existing policy requires all taxis to be fitted with calendar meters and printers by the 1st of April 2021. Listening to the trade and considering the advancements in technology, it is clear that the expense of a printer is an unnecessary requirement. The policy now allows the use of digital technology, such as a text messaging and email to provide receipts, with the option of a written receipt where preferred by the customer. The requir requirement for the calendar meter is still regarded as a necessary requirement to ensure that the correct tariff is still applied. Seating in a multi-passenger vehicle has long, long been a concern for the trade as the existing policy restricts the type of seating layout that is acceptable. This often involves changing seating configuration and requiring backwards facing seating, which customers find unacceptable. The policy now proposes to accept any manufacturer's specification seating layout provided that the other aspects of the policy in terms of sufficient boot space and adequate seating sizing are met. Unfortunately, the council still receives a number of complaints about the availability of wheelchair accessible vehicles and refused journeys due to the inability to carry a folding wheelchair in the boot. The policy proposes to retain the current requirement for 10% of the taxi fleet to be wheelchair accessible, but proposes to introduce similar 10% of fleet requirement for private hire vehicles. This will address the availability of sufficient vehicles, but also the level, level the playing field between taxis and private hire vehicles. To resolve the issue of, issue of insufficient boot space to carry a folding wheelchair, the policy now requires sufficient boot space to carry such a wheelchair and reasonable luggage. Existing vehicles that do not meet this new requirement will need to do so when replaced with a new vehicle. As members will know, safeguarding is a key component to all our licensing policies and something this council takes very seriously. The policy proposes to introduce a requirement for all management and staff involved in taking bookings from the public in the private hire operator business to have a basic DBS check. Additionally, any person involved in the day-to-day -day management of a private hire business must undertake suitable safeguarding training. These new requirements are due to the fact that private hire operators are required by legislation to keep details of all bookings, including personal data. So the council needs to ensure that suitable measures are in place to protect the public. Additionally, this record keeping and regular customer contact may provide the opportunity to recognize and report safeguarding concerns. The remainder of the proposed amendments are low impact, reflect operational changes or implement of new national standards. Thank you, Chairman. So I do apologise for the length. No, thank you ever so much, Molly. That's fantastic. Um, so can I have a proposer, please? Happy to propose. propose that. Thank you, Daniel. And a seconder, please. I'll second it. Okay, who got there first? Who was that? Was that Jim? Thank you. 
been, I think you've been pipped at the post there, Richard. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that, Chairman, but I do have a question. Yeah, do go ahead, to, please, if, Richard. Yeah. If, if I may, thank you. Um, I, I'm delighted to see the uh, the change that will uh, redress the balance or in respect of um, uh, uh, disabled vehicle carrying between the private hire fleet and the taxi fleet. That's a, a good move, and I, I, I can understand why the why the uh, taxi drivers would feel that they were being unfairly treated there. It is not clear from the report though, Madam Chairman, how this 10%, which I don't have a problem with as a, as a principle, but it's not clear how that will be actually regulated or, 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 or managed. I mean, clearly uh, a, a, an application for a license or an existing license holder who has not got a vehicle thus enabled um, has the option to uh, utilize a conventional vehicle or one that has the, the capacity to carry disabled uh, uh, passengers. So I don't understand how we are going to make sure that we have 10% of the fleet uh, with that capacity. I don't have a problem with the principle. I just don't understand from the report how we, the council, are going to ensure that that, 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 uh, that policy is actually in, enabled, enacted. Is the word uh, chair, about. chair, before you move on, uh, just so you have you got your participants list up because there are a number of yes, I know I've just got it up. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Seen, yeah, thank you, Hilary. Yeah, sorry, Molly, uh, uh, do you got any comments on that, please? Yes, yeah, so every new vehicle into the trade has to. Uh, well, at the moment, it's just based on the Hackney carriages, but the way it's worked is every new vehicle that comes in must be wheelchair accessible until we reach that 10% of the fleet. And we keep that obviously updated through the system. So we know that when we accept a new vehicle in where we're at in terms of the 10% and until now, well, until you know, since I began here, um, it's worked very well. And it was in January of this year that we reached our 10% um, target for the Hackney carriages, which meant that we could allow a further 27 new Hackney carriage vehicles into the fleet that were not um, wheelchair accessible. And that's how we propose to go forward with introducing this to the private hire sector as well. May I come back? May, may I come back, Lisa, please? Yeah. Uh, fine, understand that, and I can see now how it can be controlled. But I have to say, there would appear to be some inequalities here, and in terms of, of the, so, so driver uh, uh, owner A might come in, and we were less than ten percent. Therefore, you must have a vehicle that is compliable, com compliant. Uh, second application, we've, we've reached the ten percent, and they're not, and that that. That raises questions of equality in, in terms of, of people challenging the process. Now, I'm, I'm not being awkward. I'm absolutely happy with the principles here. Absolutely support them in every way, shape or form. But I just don't want this council uh, to put itself into a position where it's capable of being challenged on inequality. So are you absolutely happy that that process uh, is one that is legitimate in terms of, of, of the Equalities Act? So, uh, yes, um, the way we went about doing this with the Hackney carriages was that we actually sort of opened it up as an expression of interest. So it wasn't that somebody came in, so one went and had to have a wheelchair, the next one didn't. What we did to make it fair to everyone was that we notified all existing trade members and the public that we were going to be releasing some further Hackney carriage plates that were not wheelchair accessible and this meant that if they wanted to apply for it they had to complete a completely separate expression of interest form and once we received that it was on a, it was done on a first come first serve basis once we received the expression of interest form those drivers and members of the public were then eight were sort of numbered one to 27 as it was and they were contacted first and they were then provided two weeks because we felt that two weeks was a reasonable amount of time to acquire a car and to become you know the owner of the vehicle and then proceed with 
you know, the licensing of that vehicle. So there was never an opportunity for somebody to sort of get missed in that. They obviously had to be aware that that was happening. And we felt that we did that quite well through the internet and through sort of email contact as well. So I hope that, that helps to answer that query. Oh, thank you ever so much, Bo. Now, I do apologise because I didn't see the order in which um, the hands were raised. So I'm going to just go alphabetically because that seems the most um, appropriate. So, um, Mike Price, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, some clarification, please, <coughs> um, from either Mr Cobb or, uh, <coughs> oh, or uh, Molly. One of the points that came over to me when reading the changes was the fact that in the future there'll be uh, no committee and the licensing manager will determine applications and enforcement. Now, I've got a couple of questions on that for you. Number one is who passes that on to the licensing manager? Is it one of his team? Um, and number two, does that mean there will be no subcommittee in future in reference to uh, taxes? Um, or if there is, what's it going to be used for? I'll answer that one, Chair, with your permission. Yes, Councillor Ice, we'd... Although we have a licensing and appeals committee, we don't have a taxi committee as such and applications are not referred to the committee in the same way as contested applications for the Licensing Act are or contested applications for sex shops and other types of licensing. The licensing manager currently makes those decisions based on the policy that the committee adopts on whether or not somebody's fit and proper and we do it in such a way that's compliant with the, the new guidance. It's, it's been suggested in the new guidance that some councils don't have a separation in their decision making process. And the government believe that some independent decision making should be taking place. Hence a taxi committee. In North Hearts, historically, we've, we've always worked on the basis that an, a case officer deals with an application throughout until they're at the stage where they either believe it's compliant with policy and so can approve it, or it needs referring to the licensing manager for a determination. So anything that comes to me, comes to me on the basis that that's the first time I've seen it. And so therefore I can consider it with unfettered discretion in accordance with the policy that you as a committee set. Okay. I hope that answers your question, but I'm happy for any, to take any comebacks. So, um, I mean that's I mean that generally that's fine. Do you get a recommendation from the licensing officer? What I get from the licensing officer is why they're unable to grant it and what sections of the policy the application doesn't meet. What I tend to do then is read the case file, read the appropriate sections of the policy. If it's a matter about a vehicle, it's a matter about then it's it's relatively straightforward. If it's a matter about whether or not somebody's fit and proper because they have a conviction that um, hasn't yet expired under our convictions policy, I normally invite them to submit written submissions as to why they believe they are fit and proper, so I can consider all of the evidence, so they've had the ability to tell me why they think a departure from policy is appropriate. On some occasions, written evidence isn't enough. And sometimes I, I find that sitting face to face with somebody is a good way to get a better reading of them and a better understanding of if they do meet, meet fit and proper. If there's an, an element of doubt, that said, the national standards say that in there is no element of doubt for a taxi driver. If there's any doubt at all, the national guidance is we should say no. So I, I think we've got a very robust system. On occasions, I have I have sought clarification from the executive member if I'm if I, not if I'm uncertain because I I wouldn't make a decision unless I was certain. But sometimes I think 
if I'm going to make a decision to accept somebody as fit and proper, that's contrary to the policy that we've got, that I need, I need at least some member involvement. So I talk to the executive member for a bit, for a bit of a steer. And if need be, although I am predominantly the decision maker, if I think that there's something that's so important that we need the licensing committee to give me some clarity on it, then I can refer it to the subcommittee in the same way as I would a, a licensing act decision. Thank you, Steve. I'm not, I'm not doubting your ability, Steve, but is that going to be um, okay in law in case anybody comes back against your decision? Yes. Is it worth me coming in, Chair, at this yes. point, if you want me to confirm that? <laughs> I somehow thought you And might, I know Steve yeah. is very capable, but... Um, Steve's been taking the decision since at least June 2018, and we have had cases go to magistrates court, and we've been successful. So this hasn't been uh, challenged. I know we've got new national standards, but I think for the reasons explained, hopefully in the report, we think that this is a robust um, separation between the officers. And if you are going to set up a new subcommittee, regulatory committee, there will be resource implications for it. So that isn't the current recommendation. I'm happy that it is compliant because we do have that separation and we've been very successful thus far. No, I hope that answers the query. Thank you. Um, very happy with the answers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Cole. Okay, so um, Councillor Sam North, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you very much, Steve and Molly, um, for all your work you do over the year. Um, I think you've more than made up for our lack of meetings with your 400 page report tonight. So, um, so thank you. I think I had two um, questions. My first one is very similar to what uh, Councillor Fake was asking earlier about disabled taxis. I just want to understand where the 10% figure comes from really and what the uh, blockers are for individual taxi drivers to owning um, disabled uh, friendly vehicles. Uh, is it a matter of cost um, of the vehicle itself or are there um, sort of other reasons why taxi drivers may prefer a non-disabled uh, friendly vehicle uh, to a disabled friendly vehicle um, and I think the reason why I ask those questions is because 10% is definitely good uh, in my view sort of in in theory but my concern is when um, you're going about or when you're a taxi driver going about a busy Saturday evening or um, where there are sort of lots of clients to be picked up um, it might be very difficult if um, you are that taxi driver who is within the 10% to be available at the time that you're needed for that disabled person at that particular location. So how is it managed or is there any management um, ability to ensure that those disabled vehicles are in the right places where when they're needed? Um, I know that's three questions, but <laughs> I hope that that's um, clear what I'm trying to ask. Okay, so in regard to sort of demand on private, well, on wheelchair accessible vehicles, the reason we kind of want to level the playing field, if you like, with the private hires is because the majority of customers that do require a wheelchair accessible vehicle do like to pre-book it. And so in those circumstances where you know, we have only at the moment Hackney carriages that can facilitate wheelchair accessible. We want to allow that for the private hires as well, because what it can mean is that, like you say, people are left waiting because they may have booked through a Hackney carriage and because a Hackney carriage could have picked up somewhere else, there could be a delay, etc. Whereas with the private hires, they they can pre-book them and introducing this 10% they should be able to facilitate those bookings hopefully a lot quicker um, than it than it has been uh, so that was question number one uh, number two was in relation to how are we going to manage this 
again at the moment i mean the management is sort of surrounded is is down to the drivers at the moment of the hackney carriages and we hope that you know introducing this to the private hire trade that that will actually encourage them to bring more than probably 10 percent in um i think there's quite conflicting responses from the drivers. You've got the drivers of old that are very used to their saloon style vehicles that, you know, that they have driven for their careers and they don't want the expense of, of a wheelchair accessible vehicle. In terms of expense of these vehicles, yes, of course they do depend. But now I think with the way things are, a lot of the drivers are finding that the wheelchair accessible vehicles are better because they can fit more passengers in them. And so when we have, when we're sort of attracting new drivers, the initial outlay for that vehicle is actually very beneficial to them as a business because again going back to sort of the pre-bookings a lot of our sort of residential care homes you know that need these these vehicles on a regular basis they do sort of have quite good contracts with them um, and yeah so they 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 have managed them amongst themselves but I think this introduction to the private hires will only be positive and um, be positive on the public and and the trade themselves and I'm sorry I can't remember the third question <laughs> No, I think you've um, you've you've really answered them in 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 those points. I think to to come back on that exactly as you say, and that that was part of the reason why I asked the question was disabled vehicles do seem to be um, a lot more robust in in their ability to actually do sort of the daily work of of what is needed. So um, I, I would perhaps like to see ten percent as a target. Um, but I would uh, like a sort of a, a, an unwritten target to be sort of higher than that to, to get as many sort of uh, disabled vehicles as possible in the pipeline. So they're available when and when they are needed. Um, I did have a second question, um, which I know I've asked three, but they were parts of a question. Um, and that relates to the driver code of conduct section at Appendix C. Um, it's just a suggestion because there might be a reason why it's not included. Um, but when I uh, worked in the police, I, I noticed that a lot of taxi drivers were very, very aware of um, what was going on around them um, and often had a lot of information about sort of crimes that have happened or um, incidents or people of, of concern that they might pick up in their taxis. So people that were potentially victim of child sexual exploitation and things like that. So I know that we've done some fantastic work in training, um, but I'm wondering whether we could put within the code of conduct something like if a, if a taxi driver suspects or witnesses a crime being committed, um, they should contact the police. Uh, to deal with that. Um, that obviously is a um, reasonable duty of any of us and any sort of public person, um, but I just feel it would be quite beneficial to put it into the code of conduct um, so that there is a duty on that taxi driver to actually um, report some of the concerns that they now have um, training on. Yes, yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah, I don't see any reason why we couldn't do that. I mean, like you say, through the training that um, we started, uh, it was August 2019, we began the safeguarding training with the drivers. And unfortunately, we've had to go to sort of more online measures given the, the year that we've had. But the training was received really well by the drivers. Um, we had a couple of occasions where the police came in as well. Um, um, and we were working with um, the modern slavery um, team there and we, we were getting to a point where we were going to sort of start to update that training as well. So we, anything like that, I fully support and I can't see any reason why we couldn't put that into the code of conduct. But I'd like to say as well, that, you know, the drivers that have received the training so far have really filled me with confidence and they felt their feedback has been that it's given them sort of some empowerment and then some voice a voice as well and that they can report these matters and they can report these things that this they, they see 
Um, obviously, I don't have the figures yet. I'd love to know how many, if any of them, have actually reported anything back. But I'm sure that's something that we can hopefully report on next year when we can get some figures together for that. Lovely. Thank you both. Um, so, Councillor Gerald Morris, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Molly, just a small question. You mentioned at the start, I think, about how um, you're trying to simplify terminology so that the public understand things uh, more easily. Um, so did I understand it correctly that hackney carriages becomes ta uh, taxes, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so where you've got 7.1 and 7.11, where it says hackney carriages and hackney carriage fares, would that become taxes? It's only a little thing. Yes, yes. Okay, fine. That was all. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Councillor Jim McNally. Thank you, Chair. I um, just want some clarification. Uh, I'm asking for some clarification in relation to uh, the proposed policy change um, regarding child seats. And, and it, um, you say that it's, it, it's proposed that passengers uh, with children who require child seats should provide them themselves. And I'm just thinking about the, um, the feasibility and practicality of it. For example, if someone uh, goes to visit uh, someone taking a, a taxi and, um, uh, or say they're going out shopping, would they want to take a child seat with them shopping? I, you know, I, 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 and and if someone's shopping and someone gave them a lift in a in a car friend with car seats, uh, post COVID, of course, um, uh, and uh, and they needed a, a lift back home, then I, I'm just thinking about the uh, about the practicalities of it and uh, how that is going to be dealt with. That's all. Yeah, so it's unknown to, to a lot of people that actually there is no requirement for a child to be placed in a car seat in a licensed vehicle. Um, it's, it's something that actually I felt quite strongly about because working with the drivers and carrying out the checks on the vehicles, I was coming across a number of child's car seats that I personally would not want my child to go in. They were out of date, they weren't secure, they weren't safe. And it's something that I think now new rules have come in relating to children's car seats in terms of weight of child, size of child. So you could have a 10 year old, but he may only weigh sort of three stone and you know he would require a car seat where you could have a five-year-old that was a lot heavier and doesn't require a car seat and I think really it was to remove that element of doubt and to remove that you know god forbid some an accident did happen and a child had been secured in a seat by a driver that wasn't safe and wasn't fit for purpose that obviously the repercussions of that for the individual could be life-changing and so bearing that in mind and looking at the sort of the guidance in the legislation and knowing that a child doesn't have to be in a car seat is why we felt sort of strongly enough to actually state that in the policy that if a parent does require their child to be secured in a car seat that they are to supply and fit the car seat into the vehicle. Yeah um, but again I'm just wondering, um, in relation to that, um, you're going to get parents potentially who are stranded somewhere with children. Their only way to get back home might be a taxi and, um, uh, and uh, they won't have a car seat with them. Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, and surely if you, if you have an issue with car seats that are fitted by taxi drivers, then they should be, they should have the relevant uh, British standards uh, applied. They should be fitted uh, properly, and um, uh, and you know otherwise their their insurance would be at risk. Uh, and that's the same that every driver who uh, who carries children, uh, albeit their own children or family children, um, uh, actually lives and works under. I'm, I'm just concerned that that policy. Uh, is going to work against 
people uh, and, and parents uh, with young children who, um, who, who find it difficult enough to uh, get around anyway, bearing in mind the sort of uh, things that sometimes you, you do have to carry when you're, trans you're traveling with young children. That's all. And, uh, and I just wonder at the, um, uh, whether um, we could think a little bit more about how we can help them, uh, help the, the, the passengers and the drivers um, and perhaps education uh, as far as the drivers are concerned, as well as the, the passengers. I, I, I don't know, but I I've, I've just saw that and I thought, well, you know, it, it does seem wrong that we are um, uh, uh, saying to people traveling with young children, as well as all the other encumbrances that you have to take with you when you're traveling, uh, you've got to travel, you've got to carry a car seat as well, if you want to, if you may travel by taxi. Sorry, it wasn't yeah. a question. It's an it's an observation. Um, no, I, ju I just wanted to come back on that. That yes, I can I can completely see that point of view. I think that the fee the feeling on this is ultimately comes down to public safety, and as the legislation allows for a child to be secured in a seat belt in a licensed vehicle without a car seat, that I suppose mm -hmm. for you know for beyond, the, the fear of beyond, going beyond reasonable doubt that if that child was in an accident and had been secured in an unsafe car seat, rather than the legislation that allows them to be secured in just a seat belt traveling in that vehicle, then obviously there could be repercussions to that. At the minute, there's no requirement for any of our drivers to supply car seats, um, it's up to them. Um, and so I'm sure there have been occasions where they have arrived at customers' addresses and there is no car seats available to that child. Our drivers are aware of this and, and, and like I say, through sort of, you know, educating them and making them, the drivers, confident in what services they can offer and that a child is permitted to sit in those seats is what's important. I mean, obviously this is something that we can always, you know, return to and keep under review, but so far in the sort of three years that I've been here and been working on this, I'm yet to receive any complaints of um, drivers ever refusing to take children with or without car seats. Thank you. Um, Councillor Allen, did you want to say anything? You put your hand back down again, did you? I was trying to decide whether to come back on the car seat thing. I don't think you can expect drivers to have three different size car seats to weigh and measure heights of children before they um, supply a car seat. So, no, I, I just can't see. If the law covers them, I can't see that's a necessary thing. Thank you. Um, so um, now Daniel dropped out for some of that. So could we have another proposer, please? Thank you, Councillor Richard Fake. Thank you very much for that. I think you got beaten to it, Sam. By no, Richard. Chair, I, I was just going to um, ask if I may. Uh, I raised a point um, about the code of conduct. Can we just note um, that as a part of the proposal? Um, if the proposer, being Councillor Thake, is happy to accept um, that addition to the Code of Conduct, um, then that be noted as well. Lovely, thank you. Um, so if we now move to the debate, I'm going to hand over to Hilary, please. For the vote, you mean, Chair? Yeah, for the vote, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Um, um, so um, the recommendations in the report are that the uh, committee uh, be recommended to consider the responses to the public consultation, which you have done, and uh, to adopt the revised policy as attached to Appendix B, subject to any amendments. And the amendments I have are Councillor North's suggestion that uh, if a driver witnesses a crime, it, they should be required to contact the police. And I also have a note that Councillor that Councillor Morris made that. Um, it still mentions hackney carriage within the policy where it should say taxi. Um, so if you'd like to vote on that uh, using the normal method, please. Thank you, Hilary. 
That's clearly carried, Chair. Thank you. Um, so we move on to item number um, six. Sorry. Um, adoption of a statement of licensing policy required by virtue of section five of the Licensing Act 2003. Um, so I've got Steve Cobb to present, please, Steve. This one is me, Chair, and I've got a much shorter speech than Molly had. You'll be pleased to hear. Uh, this policy is a, a statutory policy, and un unlike the taxi policy where this committee has the, the power to adopt a policy, the Licensing Act policy is reserved for full council, but it, this, it's for this committee as the specialist licensing committee to review the policy, to make sure that you're happy with it and to forward a proposed policy to full council, hopefully for adoption. As with all policies, it's been kept under regular review to make sure it remains fit for purpose. We have a duty to review it every five years but we would review it sooner than that if we felt it wasn't working for whatever reason. The policy seems to, seeks to strike a balance between the protection of the public and the promotion of a vibrant, diverse, and most importantly, safe daytime and nighttime economy. In general terms, the policy is working very well. It allows consistent decision-making, which is helped in no small part by some very effective decision making by the subcommittees that are formed to deal with contested applications. It's important to note that since the policy has been in place originally, it's very rare for us to be challenged in court and when we have, we have yet to be beaten. So that's a combination of good policy and good decision making by members. The amendments proposed in this review seek to build on that success but to reflect the council's current priorities and strategies and just clarify some minor issues over wording that's arisen over the last five years. It's disappointing that we only received one response. And at, at first I was, I was particularly disappointed because we'd invited all license holders, all statutory consultees and the public through regular social media contact to engage in this. But on reflection, I'm taking it that only one response means that everybody in North Hearts is happy with the policy. I think I can find and always find a positive spin on those sorts of things. The statutory guidance and council policy place a responsibility on the applicant to consider the applicant the impact of their application on the locality. And that's always been difficult in the past, particularly for people that are coming to North Hearts to to start a business with little knowledge of the area. So for the first time, we've followed the lead of the gambling policy and we've included a local area profile so that the applicants can be aware of North Arts as a district and what matters they, they need to consider in terms of the licensing objectives. The policy is a matter for council. I can't amend the policy, but the policy is worded in such a way that the live profile as it's a factual statement of statistics can be kept live and can be amended throughout the duration of the policy so that the statistics are always up to date when new stats become available. You remember from last year's annual report that we're looking to introduce a pre-application advice service, partly to raise some additional revenue for the council, but more importantly, to assist our customers. Customers are always moaning to us that they have to go to very expensive solicitors or very expensive licensing agents and pay often exorbitant prices. I think the highest I've heard is somebody having to pay £1,500 for a very basic application. We believe that we can give all the necessary advice, even for a complex application in, in two hours, and we're looking to charge cost, which is £60 an hour. So we as well as raising some money for the council, we can also save our customers a great deal of money. And in order to implement that service, we need it in the policy so that it's clear how that system will work. We don't want people to think that just because we're giving them advice, they'll automatically get a license because that's not a case. And the policy just clarifies the role of the advice 
the fact that it doesn't guarantee a license. I think that's a, a really important clarification. As with the taxi policy and all licensing policies, the importance of safeguarding can't be underestimated. Five years ago, we put a section in the policy for the first time dealing with child sexual exploitation. This year, we're looking to go further and we've introduced a new section addressing all aspects of safeguarding, giving applicants and license holders an indication of what we expect of them and the role that they can play in safeguarding children and vulnerable people. Some of you have been on the committee for some time now, and for those of you involved in the numerous Sandon hearings over the past few years, you'll remember residents getting very, very frustrated and not being able to understand why certain matters were not relevant to the Licensing Act when it was very, very relevant to them. In the case of Sandon, particularly conservation, flora and fauna, but they're, they're things that we can't consider under the licensing process. We've put some clarity in the policy to explain that so that we're trying to manage some expectation and, and highlight that licensing is restricted to the very narrow consideration of four licensing objectives. But also explaining to the residents of Sandon and others that whilst things such as flora, fauna, conservation may not be relevant to the application process, if an event subsequently caused issues under the Wildlife and Countryside Act and the license holder was convicted of a matter relating to those non-relevant issues, that's criminality and it would then become relevant on a review. And I think, again, it's important to put that clarification into the policy. And finally, and, and I'm sure most importantly, to support the Council's declaration of a climate emergency and, and our climate strategy, we've included environmental considerations in the policy for the first time. Now, as I've said, the Licensing Act has a very narrow remit for licensing objectives, and environmental issues are not an automatic fit into any of those. So the, the vast majority of what we've put in the policy is encouragement for people to be aware of the environment because it's not things that we can necessarily mandate. However, there are some environmental issues that do relate or relating particularly to outdoor events that are very close to the public nuisance objective, particularly matters of waste management. So out, outdoor events where we require a, a waste management policy, we're looking to encourage the use of compostable um, glassware for want of a, a better phrase, have an effective waste management plan, recycling as part of that. So that was quite a long winded way of saying that whilst we can't directly influence the environment through our licensing objectives, we encourage it where we can, we will mandate it where it links to the public nuisance ob objective. Other than that, the, the remainder of the proposed changes are low impact operational changes and I think I probably said enough at that point. Oh, thank you, Steve. Can I have a proposer, please? Thank you, Councillor Mike Rice. And a seconder, please. Thank you. I think Richard, I think Councillor Richard, thank God in there, just pipped you to the post, Jim. Thank you both. Um, and nobody's raised their hands for the debate. So if we can move to the vote, please, Hilary. Oh, sorry, yeah. Sam's just popped his hand up. Don Sam. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a very quick question about uh, the fees that we charge for applicants of licenses and where the um, decision uh, is to be made on, on the fees that are charged. Is that uh, the responsibility of this committee for council, executive member or yourself? Sorry, using the wrong mouse. The fees under the Licensing Act are set centrally by government. We are told on a regular basis that they have been set to cover our reasonable costs. They don't cover our reasonable costs by a very, very long way. To give you, to give you a comparison, 
the amount of work involved in a licensing act application is very similar to a betting shop application. Under the Gambling Act, we can set our own fees. And off the top of my head, because I don't have it in front of us, we charge a fee of approximately two and a half thousand pounds for a new betting shop application, which reflects our costs. Under the Licensing Act, the centrally set fees alter on the basis of rateable value, but the most prevalent band is band B and we get 180 pounds. So if anybody has got the influence to press with government that we need to be able to recover our full costs, that would be very much appreciated. Just to give you a complete answer for the remainder of licensing fees that are set locally, some are executive and set by the executive member and the non-executive ones are set by Jeanette as the service director. But this committee has the ability as it has done in the past to pass a resolution giving us guidance on how you believe they should be set. Lovely. Thank, thank you and, and thank you very much chair as well i think um it's important to note that there are um difficulties with uh, the amount of money that we do receive and i think going into the challenging times um that we are with uh the high uh, levels of, of budget deficit that we're currently facing um i do think that it's something that we need to uh, consider and uh, push uh, to government but thank you very much no, oh, thank you. And so could we move to the vote, please, Hilary? I'll let you lead the... Uh, certainly, Chair. Um, so the recommendations are that uh, the committee be recommended to consider the responses to the public consultation, which you have done, and support the proposed statement of licensing policy as attached at Appendix D, subject to any amendments of which there are n were none proposed, and that you recommend to full council the... Uh, adoption of the statement of licensing policy. So if you can vote in the normal way, please. Oops, I'm talking to myself here. I'm sorry, councillors. Um, and that's carried, thank you. Oh. Right, at, at last, I think I've got, stop, uh, I'm muting myself. Um, that's clearly carried, thank you. Lovely. Thank you ever so much, Hilary. So we just move on to item number seven now, which is the licensing service annual report. And I'll stand over, um, hand over to Steve Cobb, please, to present that. And you'll be even more pleased to know that I have less to say on this one, because this is this is basically a, a report of the year that I'll just I'll comment briefly on. But the, the idea of this report is, is something we introduced a couple of years ago. And it's basically to give the licensing committee more involvement than just setting policies and setting back and, and leaving officers to, to get on with things. This is an opportunity to look at the workload that we're doing, look at what we've got proposed coming forward and, and to comment on it. Give us any thoughts of where you think we should be focusing if we have the resources to do it and, and any other anything else that you think the licensing team could be doing or could be doing better or could be doing more of because obviously we do it day in day out and sometimes you can become very narrow sighted and blinkered and thinking that what you're doing is sufficient where you have the opportunities to step back and say well actually have you thought of this and we could find that very useful all i wanted to say in terms of the report is if you just look at look at it on the basis of pure statistics you'll see that the number of licenses, the number of applications, the number of inspections, the number of service requests have all gone down based on last year. That doesn't mean we've been sitting around doing nothing, and I'm sure none of you would have thought that, but the, the lockdown and the ongoing national position is, is having a, sub, a substantial impact. Temporary event notices are no longer going ahead. People are not pushing to get personal licenses. People are not pushing to open new businesses or expanding or amending businesses. So our workload in terms of quantifiable work has gone down. But of course, we've had a huge amount of work to do that we can't quantify in terms of helping guide in business through the pandemic, keeping them up to date on regulations that come out sporadically, normally at midnight the day before they take effect. And if you look at industries such as the entertainment industry, 
I can't remember the exact count, but there's there's somewhere around six or seven different pieces of guidance that you need to look at, depending on what part of the entertainment industry you're in. And they contradict. One, for example, says pubs shouldn't be having live music. The other one says pubs can have live music with the following caveats. And so we have we're having to guide people through this. We're doing that by lots of email communications. We have got email addresses for virtually all of our licensees now to be able to do quick updates on important things like regulations. But where it's unquantifiable is the amount of phone calls that my team have been taking on a regular basis because questions pop into licensees' heads all the time. We're regularly getting questions of, I've just been asked if I can take a booking for a wake at a funeral, for example, how many people are allowed in my pub? And so the officers have been working very, very hard. And I just want to get that point across that just because the stats are down, it doesn't mean that work has, has stopped. Based on the stats that we have reported today, I think that had there not been a lockdown, the applications, the licenses, the service requests, would have been significantly up on, on last year. I think that's all I want to say at the moment because I think it's more important that I hear from members at this point and that you tell us what you think of the service and where you think we should be going. Well, that's great. Thank you, Steve. Has anybody got any queries to raise or points? Um, so, Councillor Daniel Allen, please. Just to say thank you. Um, I've chaired a licensing meeting. Um, I've been part of quite a few of the hearings and just thank you very much to the officers for the work they've been doing during these difficult times. Mm. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Well done. Um, Ian Albert. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I, yeah, I really echo, uh, echo uh, Councillor Allen's uh, comments to thank the, the, you know, the team for all their work and indeed obviously the advice that, that you offer to you know to councillors both those who are involved in licensing and obviously those who are not um you know involved in licensing stuff on any either day-to-day -day or, or, re or regular regular basis uh, one of the questions I, I think i had was the question i had was as how you felt steve that the um the interfaces with you and the planning team uh, in terms of the, that sort of boundary between sometimes the things that clearly come up in, in planning applications that are obviously need to be referred to licensing and indeed in, in, to some degree vi there is some vice versa uh, in, in there that, 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 come, that comes up uh, in relation to some licensing applications. And I'm just interested to hear how you felt that that was, was working and whether there are other ways that, that indeed, you know, that could be improved if, if you felt it needed to be improved. Thank you, that's, that's, a, that's a really good point because we have this very strange situation under the Licensing Act where planning are a responsible authority, but they find it very difficult to put in a representation because the guidance, which is statutory and we have to have regard to, says that licensing and planning are two completely separate regimes and there should be this artificial wall between them and we should never meet. To a certain extent, but a lesser extent, we, we were experiencing similar problems with the fire service over issues of public safety and with environmental health on some nuisance issues as well. So what we've put together is a responsible authorities forum chaired by Molly, where we can all get together quarterly and thrash these points out. Unfortunately, we, we hadn't really had much engagement from the planning side of things after John Chapman left, John was dealing with planning issues and he was very good at put, not putting in a representation, but giving us a note of it on any issues that were dealt with at planning that we felt that we could deal with in licensing. So if planning restricted opening hours, for example, we didn't then grant a license for longer hours because then there's the confusion over 
I've got a license, surely that trumps my planning. So, um, but fortunately, we're we're developing that working relationship with the planners again. We're we're dealing more with the enforcement officers and saying we're letting them know we've got an application. We're telling them what the application is and asking them if they've got any issues and they're passing issues on as well. Unfortunately, sometimes planning issues can't be fed into licensing. We we can only really deal with licensing hours. We can't. We haven't got the wider remit of of the impact on the locality that that planning has. But I don't think it's been a great relationship in the past. But I'm confident that it's improving as we move forward. Thanks, Steve. That's helpful. Lovely. Thank you. And Councillor Sam North. Thank you, Chair. I have uh, two questions. Um, the first one is in relation to COVID. Uh, we see that quite a few um, licensed individuals and premises are fairly disproportionately affected by um, COVID. Um, for example, nightclubs and bars and um, we, we see sort of in, in the earlier report that taxi drivers are seeing a, a much reduced uh, income. Do you feel that what the District Council has done so far uh, in relation to um, COVID and its response uh, sort of as led by the County Council um, and their uh, uh, recovery boards and, and resilience um, forums has been right? Uh, and is there anything that you perhaps would do differently? Um, and indeed, as we go into a second lockdown, are there any things that you are anticipating could um, be done in order to prevent sort of as much of an impact on, on those license holders? Uh, I do have a second question, but I'll ask that one first um, and then come in with my second, if okay. That's a tough one. That that feels more like I'm sitting in front of a select committee in the Houses of Parliament. But All right. <laughs> to, to, to give you an, an answer as, as best I can, I don't I don't particularly want to, to comment on the, the, the county council because it's some it's something out of our our control, other than to say that we have been given regular updates on information and we have sent out a number of joint correspondence from the Director of Public Health and the licensing team that have been drafted by the Public Health team to, to get the message across that compliance is in, important, particularly with the numbers rising in, in North Hearts at the moment. So I, I think the, the liaison with the, the County Council, just from a licensing perspective, has been as good as it can. From a District Council response, within the limitations of the finance that we've got available, I think that we've done all that we can. We've, we've certainly engaged as a team and passed on as much information as we can. You may have seen from the survey that we did amongst the taxi drivers that they were concerned about financial support. We was able to signpost them to the council's specific webpage on COVID where the team that was administering grants and discounts and reduced rates had summarised everything nicely. So that was there. We work very closely with our colleagues in environmental health who are the enforcers of the COVID regulations because the regulations made under the Public Health Act. So we're making sure that we're giving the joined up message. There would be nothing worse than us giving some advice and a separate enforcement agency going out and enforcing on the different tact so we're, we're making sure that we're working together in that respect obviously the council has limited resources we have been asked a number of times could we waive fees could we reduce fees is there anything that we can do on fees to to help businesses but of course it's not that simple the fees that we set other than the central government ones, are to reflect our costs. And if we were to waive fees or if we were to discount fees, that's a knock-on effect to the finances of the council that are already very, very difficult. And I'm led to believe that the expense of the council far outweighs what we're getting back from central government at the moment. That, that may well change. 
So what we've tried to do is be as flexible as possible. Certainly bars, restaurants that were closed for four months, was it four months during the, the lockdown? If their annual fee came due, we didn't chase them for it. We, own, we only chased them for their annual fee when they were open and unable to trade again. Those that are experiencing very, very severe financial difficulty have only just started trading again and are trading at a very limited capacity. We do have options like payment plans rather than expecting the whole fee to be paid. So I, I think we're doing as much as we can, given that we've got limited finances and limited resource. No, thank you very much. Sorry if my question was a bit too um, <laughs> sordid. I didn't mean it to be that way. But um, my second question is uh, in relation to the licensing objectives, one of them is clearly public safety. Do we anticipate that there will be any changes uh, in legislation or in even workload among your team due to the fallout of uh, COVID and, and potential for future pandemics uh, and their impacts on licensed premises? Uh, or is that something, again, that might not be a question you, you will be able to answer now, uh, but it would be good perhaps for this committee to, to know whether there will be any sort of substantial changes in that sort of regard, public safety? I'm not anticipating specific changes through legislation in terms of public safety, but I, I think there's always the danger of another pandemic around the corner, sadly, and another public health issue. So whilst public health is not a licensing objective in, its, in itself, there is a link, to, as you say, to public safety. Public safety under the Licensing Act is ensuring people are safe on a licensed premises. And so I, I certainly the amount of work for my team has increased significantly helping businesses through the existing pandemic. I don't see that um, reducing any time soon, even if, even if we're fortunate enough to get to a stage where we have a, a vaccination and things are getting back to relatively new normal. There's always going to be help that we're going to need to give to the businesses. And I think the impact of this pandemic has certainly put other things foremost in people's minds. And yeah, I think long, long term, it, there is going to be a role for us, not necessarily regulatory, but advisory and, and assisting with coordinating licensed premises across the different services in this council and of course county council as well. Lovely, thank you. Um, Daniel, is your hand still raised from earlier on or did you have a... I'm sorry, I didn't realise it was, my apologies. No, 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 that's fine, thank you. Um, so Councillor Gerald Morris, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Steve, under total licences, um, at the bottom of that grid, You've got, you have substantially fewer taxi drivers than you do taxi vehicles. Can you, I'm, I'm sure it's correct, but I just don't understand the logic of that. Could you explain? Yes, it's, it's, the, nat it's the nature of our, our trade. And a vast, a, va a significant proportion of our trade are self-employed owner drivers. So you've got one driver and their own car, but we have an increasing number of businesses that have a fleet of vehicles. And what they're finding very difficult at the moment is getting drivers to, to come into the trade, partly now because of the pandemic, partly because the drivers keep telling us that there's not enough work in North Hertfordshire for all of the vehicles. And so the number of drivers has dropped off. So yes, a, a lot of businesses have got cars sitting around waiting for drivers. And what also happens as well is sometimes drivers will, will get a dual badge that allows them to drive a taxi and a private hire. They'll buy their own taxi and they'll drive their own taxi. But if they haven't got sufficient work as a taxi driver, they will then go and work for a private hire company and drive a private hire vehicle using their private hire license. 
Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We've got no, no other questions. Um, we do need to have a proposer and um, have we got a proposer, please? Oh, thank you, Councillor Thake. And then Jim McNally, Councillor McNally, you've got your... Oh, Madam Chairman, I had a question. Oh, go on, sorry. I'm not happy to propose, but I just, I just need clarification. My understanding, Steve, is that essentially, even though they can hold what in essence is a dual licence, it can't be the same vehicle. Is that right? Because a taxi is a taxi 24-7, isn't it? That's exactly right, Councillor Thake. Okay. That, that's why they have the dual licence, so that gives them the option to drive both types of vehicle, but each vehicle can only be one or the other. I, I just wanted that clear. Thanks, thanks, Madam Chairman, and, and I'm happy to propose. Lovely, thank you. And um, Councillor McNally, was your hand up for a seconder? Or... Thank you very much, appreciate that. So um, can I move to you, Hilary, to, um, for the vote, please? Certainly, Chair. So the recommendations are that the committee rent recommend, uh, sorry, be recommended to review the annual report and comment on its content, which you have done, and to note the annual report. If you can vote in the normal way, please. And that is clearly carried, Chair. Lovely. Thank you ever so much. And um, thank you ever so much for everybody coming tonight, because that is the close of the meeting. So thank you all. We'll see you soon.